Hello! Once again, it is I, DJ Church Warden, coming to you live from homebrewrp.tv here on Twitch. Uh, tonight we're trying something a little different. I'm going to be offering you up a loving spoonful, if you will, of tips, tricks, tactics, ideas, and whatnot for all of you aspiring dungeon masters and players alike. I uh, do hope we will get some people to join us. Uh, as always, I'm open to questions and suggestions, provided they are nothing too incredibly lewd, because this is Twitch, and we do have decency standards. That being said, let's get right into it. <laughs> First off, thank you for joining me. Um, a little background on me myself. I am actually a old grognard, if you will, a veteran. I have been playing Dungeons and Dragons since 1982, starting with basic D&D, &D, the old red and blue books, for those of you who may remember. I have played every iteration except for one of Dungeons and Dragons. I won't say which one right off the bat because, well, Let's be totally honest. Um, I don't want to show favoritism, right? <laughs> All that being said, though, uh, most of the time has been spent as a dungeon master. I've created countless homebrew works, um, including the recent one, if you follow our channel, The World of Cairn, which is a completely unique uh, world of my own creation. We're currently playtesting it uh, three Saturdays a, a month, first, second, and third, so I would encourage you to tune in. One of the things we're going to be doing this evening, aside from granting some basic information to try and help you guys expand your own horizons, is towards the end of the session I will be actually going over and creating live a city. Uh, within my homebrew realm, within the realm of Cairn, as I create this city, I would like to encourage you to not only ask questions, but to make suggestions and recommendations and things you would like to see within this city so that we can explore the actual subtle nuances that make this city believable, uh, realistic, and viable, a, a functional part of our unique world. So that being said, once again, uh, tonight, I want to focus on uh, the environment, um, the ecology of the dungeon. Now, there was, back in the old days, 2nd and 3rd edition D&D, there was a big series uh, inside of Dragon Magazine called the Ecology of Series. And one of the brilliant parts of the Ecology of Series is every iteration of that particular article set they would delve deep, really deep, into the actual ecology of a specific creature, uh, an aboleth or a, a boulette or a hobgoblin, so that you could actually see that there wasn't just a, this is an evil creature A, B, C, and D in your game, but it was instead an actual viable, vibrantly living organism, something that had motivations, something that had a, a will and a, a desire for survival, a societal structure, political structure, etc., etc. And it's one of the things that really helped bring to life a monster in the game. Um, right now, there's a lot of sociopolitical uh, dialogue occurring within D&D, &D, and please, just a disclaimer, I don't want to get into that on the air. Um, your opinions are your own, and I respect them, no matter what they are. But right now, people are wanting to diversify races and creatures within the game so that they're not just a black and white, just a bottom line, this is an evil creature, this is what it does because it's an evil creature, and they want to expand on that and show some diversity, which is exactly what those articles uh, did. So with that in mind, going into the creation of your own homebrew world, one of the things I would like to address is the most important character in your game. Now, 
when I say the most important character in your game, uh, this also applies to any form of writing that you may do. The most important character in your game is actually the environment. You cannot build on sand. So when I say it is an, a viable and extremely important character within your game, what I'm actually referring to is it has to work. Your environment has to work. If you go out in the woods behind your house, for instance, there is a vibrant, fluctuating, organic ecology there. Life feeds on life, feeds on life, feeds on life. Everything is there for a reason. Everything there serves a purpose. Everything there came from something else and relies on something else. So when we get into the ecology of your own creation, I know this is going to seem almost far-fetched or, or maybe even a little too attentive to detail, but it's true. Everything within that has to serve meaning and have purpose, at least within the realm and the mind of the game master. Now, players as a game master are, and I please, I say this loosely, the bane of your existence. If there is a way to derail your story, to screw up the setting, your players will find it, guaranteed. And it's one of the more brilliant aspects of gaming in that regard, because as a game master, it keeps you constantly on your toes. You constantly have to be able to work on the fly. You have to be able to draw from your intellectual resources, your knowledge base, on the fly, quickly. And remember, just like as in broadcast or radio, dead air is dead air. So the, the more time it takes you to look up details or try to figure something out, the less your players are engaged. And as a storyteller, as a game master, your goal is to engage your audience, your, your players, primarily, but in this modern age, of course, we're streaming uh, our games constantly. So you need to engage your audience as well. And especially the people who aren't actively playing, you're going to lose their interest quickly if you're having to dig through resources and, and books and whatnot to figure things out as you're going. So the more you know about your environment, the more smooth that's going to happen. So let's take, for instance... Uh, a, a classic, right? A cave environment, right? So, you can say on the one hand to your players, you've entered a big spooky cave. Woo! And it's, oh, it's so scary, right? So that, sure, it gets the point across. You are in big scoopy, big scoop, scoopy, <laughs> big spooky cave A. However, what that doesn't do is bring that cave to life. And as I said, your environment is a very, the most important uh, character in your story. So, first off, let's say, is this a natural cave? Or is this a cave that was sculpted into the rock side, right? Um... This is, once again, a very important feature. It's something that needs to be addressed. For this particular exercise, let's say this is a natural cave, okay? So within this natural cave, is it a barren cave? Is it a, a vibrant living cave? What is in the cave, okay? So let's, let's, let's pick a monster and put it in the cave, okay? So at the entrance to this cave, we have... Let's see. What's a good example? Any, anybody, and of course, once again, suggestions are open. If you got one, please feel free to throw it out there, and we'll we'll build from there. Um, a good intro monster to cave. Let's say we have a number of skeletons, three or four skeletons, that are laid out at the entrance of the cave. They animate when the players come in. Okay. Um, skeletons are interesting because they can exist in any environment. However, the environment that the skeletons exist in could functionally change their appearance, the way they move and react, and, of course, the reason they ended up there in the first place. Oh, well, werebear's a good 
choice there, Chance. We'll get into the werebear next, I promise. <laughs> so just to start with the skeletons, right? Um, let's say that the werebear killed the skeletons, okay? And that's that's a good one. So the werebear killed the skeletons. They were there on a holy quest to retrieve artifact D, and they failed in their quest because the werebear slayed them. And in the afterlife, they weren't allowed to rest. So now they will rise up when disturbed from the mossy surface. And we're going there. See, mossy surface, which implies moisture, which implies a water source within the cave. So from the mossy surface, which obscures them from view, once again, causing the players to have to actively make a perception roll to see them, or be surprised, potentially, they rise up from the mossy surface and attack. Um, their bones are wet, so they're going to have more of a greenish, yellowish hue. Um, they're not going to be brittle. Uh, they're going to make less noise on the stone surface because of this, because of the moss coating and the moisture in the bone, which you could, as a DM, feasibly use to increase any stealth rolls they may be using or decrease Perception chances of seeing them with a, a small penalty. Don't be mean to your players with this. It, it's the first in, encounter of the cave. And of course, because of the moisture, once again, their weapons are going to be rusty. Uh, the leather they might be wearing is going to be deteriorated. Uh, buckles, uh, that type of thing, are going to be deteriorated. Now, you could use this, once again, to be cruel, to add things like tetanus into your game, if you want to go there. But at the, more importantly, as a, as a role-play uh, mechanic, instead of saying on the baseline, four skeletons get up and attack you, now it's as you pass through the mouth of the mossy, uh, wet cave entrance, your perception roll succeeds, and you hear the soft, creaking sound of something rising up behind you. You turn to look and there is a green tinted moss covered skeleton rising up from the, the surface of the cave, dripping with moisture, holding up a nasty rusted short sword and clinging desperately to the rotted leather and mildewed shield. So, I mean, right there alone, we have a much better painted picture of this creature than we did four skeletons got up off the cave floor. All right, so our, our players dispatch the skeletons with ease. They're, they're heroes, after all. No big deal. They move deeper in, and as Chance suggested, inside the cave is a werebear, right? So before we go too much further, let's do this. I'm going to pull up a, uh, a, the stats on the werebear, right? So we have these in front of us to look at. Do, 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 roll 20 compendium. That'll work. So here we go. We have the werebear stats right here, right? Uh, we're going to go over these real briefly. I don't need to obviously read out all of these, but we have a shape changer, right? So lycanthropy, which is the, the condition that leads to where creatures happening, for instance, is technically a disease. It allows them to turn into this weird hybrid between the humanoid and the were creature, the lycanthrope. So most creatures, most were creatures, do not have this curse by choice. I won't say all, most don't. So right off the bat, we need to decide who this werebear is. All right, so we're gonna say this is John Hopkins Kangas the third. That's for you, Chance. Uh, Johns Hopkins Kangas the third, who is a local lord who was bitten while defending his keep from another werebear. He was infected with the disease and forced into exile so that he wouldn't kill Lady Brittany, who is the love of his life and the most beautiful woman he's ever seen. 
Yes, that's on purpose. <laughs> so here he is in the cave in exile to protect the woman he loves far from his home. Um, he's completely unaware of Artifact D that the skeletons, before they were skeletons, came looking for. They found him on one of his bad nights when he was changed. He attacked and killed them because he's a CR5. As you can see here, and the skeleton warriors before they were skeletons were probably level one creatures. So now we have a story unfolding, um, a vista, if you will, within just the opening of our cave. So here's the swear bearer. Um, he exists in this cave. Now, this is important to keep in mind. He is a living creature. And although lycanthropy makes him more than normal human, we'll call superhuman, so to speak, um, immortal in some cases in a way, but not, not true immortality, he still has to eat. He's still hungry. He still has to sleep and function. He's still going to switch back to his human form, which is more susceptible to the, the environmental um, concerns of exposure, cold, uh, damp, um, he's still going to need to sleep. So, in the back of the cave now, this wet, damp, mossy cave, we have to create an environment that this werebear, this Johns Hopkins Kangas, the third, can live in, right? So, he's going to need a place to sleep, he's going to need a clean water source, he's going to need a source of food, He's going to need some place to store and dry these foods because it's not feasible for an entire human creature or an entire werebear to feed itself on just cave crickets and fish that are this big that it finds within little pools in the cave. Um, he's probably also going to need some sort of shelter. So in the back of the cave, we have a makeshift lean-to or a bivouac if you want to go there made of branches that he scavenged from outside the cave in human form, tied together with strands of plant fiber he made from reeds and, and whatnot, and kind of lashed together to form a makeshift lean-to that he can sleep behind, store things in, and hide in. Now, as I mentioned earlier, he's also going to need a water supply. So... That's fairly easy. It's a damp cave. Chances are there's going to be some type of pools, uh, mineral deposit laden as they may be, but pools of water nonetheless. And the pools in here could be trickling out from underground, underground uh, water sources, uh, creeks, rivers. There's all kinds of that type of stuff underground. And from there, it could also, once again, you know, have the fish in it. Um, Cave crickets are always a big thing. There are various crustaceans that have been known to live in caves. Um, we're going to pull up some more details just to show you kind of places to look for this type of thing. Um, I mean, let's be honest. Uh, look at this. Scholarly articles for cave ecology, cave ecosystems, how stuff works. So this is just, I'm not going to go through this whole thing, but this is just an example um, of a, a wealth of information that we have within our, our, our reach. No, thank you. Uh, how stuff works. A wealth of information at our reach, at our fingertips here, to find the details we need as we're creating this. And please, please, Dungeon Masters especially, Game Masters especially, do the prep work. Take some time before your sessions read up on this, take notes. You don't even have to write anything anymore as we did in the old days. You can literally copy and paste lines at a time into a text document and have it ready to go when you need it. So please do the do your players a service. Take the time and make some notes. Um, I won't harp on that. But one of the things I love about this article is it's talking about the cave food pyramid. So you have scavengers. Uh, you have things that eat the other creatures in the cave, um, eggs, uh, millipedes, crustaceans, 
salamanders, cave fish, smaller insects, um, larger than life centipedes. I mean, this is already building so much. You've got bacteria, you got fungi, um, animals that feed on droppings, you know? So, I mean, just that little bit of information right there has opened up so many opportunities for other things that are living in here. Not only because your players are going to need a way to survive within the cave, but because your players are going to probably derail your story and go off on a tangent. So let's say they they manage to either subdue or defeat Johns Hopkins Kangas the Third. Okay, maybe they're really kind and they've even cured him somehow. Either way, we've bypassed the threat. Um, they search through his his lean to. They find his. Uh, stash of dried fish on leaves that he's scavenged and mossy bed that he's created. Um, search through all that. And as they've carried on in, the cavern opens up into a, a, a corridor, a natural formation within the cave that leads deeper into the underground, into the bedrock. Um, it starts to dry out a little bit as we go, but it's still fairly damp. You've got condensation on the walls. You can hear dripping in the distance. Of course, the dripping water in a cave environment leads to stalactites and stalagmites. Now, I'm going to pull this up. Right? This is important, ladies and gentlemen, and everything in between. A stalagmite is a type of rock formation that rises from the floor. This is a big source of confusion for a lot of people. Um, stalagmites rise from the floor. So one way to remember this, and it may seem stupid, but it helps me, so I'll share it with you. A stalagmite might fall over. A stalactite is held tight on the ceiling. That's how I remember so tight on the ceiling might fall over. Um, however, as I said, mineral deposits dripping from the ceiling cause stalactites and stalagmites. Um, as it says here, they're primarily composed of calcium carbonate, may consist of lava, mud, peat, pitch, sand, center, and amberette, which is going to change the color. For now, we're going to just say the calcium carbonate, the standards, which you're going to see in, in, in these most of these pictures here. Are, are what we're talking about, that, that color scheme. So as we go deeper into the cave, the walls take on a, a orange, yellow, brown hue. There's a shine to it if anyone's using a, a light source, a torch or a lantern. And that adds some ambience to the situation, reflections, the way the shadows play um, in the distance as, as the team is traveling in. So we'll say our next room, as it opens up into it, has a lot of settled water into it. So in here, we're going to see a room. Um, let's see. Probably more like... I will say something like this, right? Right here. So yeah, we'll say you're going to see a room, something similar to this, right? So as you can see here, we've got, ooh, that's getting crazy. We, we've got, uh, we have a water source here. We have the, the, the stalactites dripping down, the stalagmites here, although I think a lot of this is reflective. Um, the lights, of course, are not natural in, in almost every picture you're going to find. But as you can see, this is definitely a, an ecosystem in here. What's in the water? What's living there? How is it surviving based upon the, the, the mineral composition of the water? What's growing in here? So we're going to say right back in our, our cave we have a load of fungus, right? Um, a whole bunch of mushrooms, lichens, moss, mildew have taken up residence in a, in a particular shallow pool. Um, one of my favorite things to throw into situations like this are uh, 
Oops. Oh, wow. I need to learn how to spell, huh? Let's see. Are shriekers. Um, shriekers are interesting because they're not terribly dangerous. Um, it looks like a normal fungus, a mushroom. Uh, what they do is if they get lit up within 30 feet, it emits a shriek audible within 300 feet, and it continues to do it until the disturbance moves out of range, right, pretty much for a few rounds. And what this does is it attracts anything else with an earshot to come investigate the noise, right? So uh, for newbie players especially, this is great because they don't, immediately know how to deal with it. And a lot of veterans really will mess up here too because it's a tricky situation. Number one, we have a bed of fungus. Um, this thing's ability, this false appearance, is as long as it remains motionable, motionless, it's indistinguishable from an ordinary fungus. So we have a whole pile of wet fungus on the floor that just got lit up by the party's light source and it's just steady shrieking. They don't know which one's doing it. It's too wet to burn the whole thing, short of magic. Um, and it's attracting God knows what from without, you know, throughout the cave. So this is another obstacle that they're going to need to overcome, right? So let's say they just go nuts and start hacking at it. It's a pretty standard player tactic. <laughs> So they go and start hacking at it. They eventually kill it, right? At the same time, from deeper in the cave, we're going to get a little more classic here. They have accidentally pulled a hook horror from deeper in the cave, right? Um, the bipedal subterranean monstrosity, which is a great description of them. The hook horrors are in them of themselves a very big classic creature um, from way back. Um, head of a vulture, neck of crested feathers, body of a beetle. Uh, I mean, this is a really incredible chimera of sorts, a, a creature that's a hodgepodge of different types of creatures come together to create this horror, this hook horror. Um, the hooks, as you can see in the picture here, it uses this is primary means of combat. Um, it is a subterranean creature, and one of the nice things about this particular site, the the uh, Forgotten Realms wiki, if you're not familiar with it, is it actually does get into what I've mentioned, the ecology of it. So here, if we if we take a little notes here, the hook horrors live as families, no more than a dozen subterranean caves led by the eldest male. So right off the bat, we can pretty much assume that this is either one of the warrior class members of this community or the elder male itself. So for our example here, we're going to say this is the elder male, okay? Um, the elder male comes to inspect what's going on and see what's making all the noise, what pissed off the shriekers, okay? Um, now this is a monster. It's it's a neutral alignment. It's not necessarily evil. They're not terribly intelligent as far as standard versions of intelligence go. What our expectation of intelligence? Um, uh, they're they they sleep a lot. They're sluggish when not under threat. They survive in very little food. Um, they migrate when it is very scarce. They're egg layers, so there's probably a clutch back there that they're needing to protect, which is why the rest of them didn't come out. So once again, we can automatically assume that there is more than this one hook horror. Once again, the players don't need to know this. They may not realize this, but in the back of your mind, as a game master, this is a up-and-coming challenge. This is another encounter waiting to happen, and a much bigger one. Even though this is the Elder Male, if they fight and defeat this Elder Male... We have a whole slew potentially back in the cave waiting for our unsuspecting uh, adventurers. Um, they don't live a long time, 40 years, average lifespan here. Uh, they do have a language. 
uh, and can speak under common. So when I said they're not terribly intelligent, this is kind of uh, one of those things that reading kind of helps with. They're intelligent enough to communicate. So given the neutral alignment, their ability to actually communicate in under common in their own language, let's say this hookover comes out sees the party and then under common asks what are you doing here trying to suss out if this party which outnumbers the creature is a threat or not so we have a role play opportunity here if someone in the party speaks under common or can kind of work out based upon uh, body language in the situation what's going on this whole encounter could go from violent and negative to a little more of a passive situation. The hookor is trying to protect its clutch, trying to protect its community, and realizes that it's outnumbered, sees the potential threat of the party, and does not want to risk its, its young and its community. It is not just some mindless, nameless beast. This is the elder of a community of Hakoras that are just trying to survive within this cave. Originally they had the werebear that kind of kept things out, which made where they were situated such a, a, a great place. Now they can live off of just about anything. They don't need light. They can eat just about anything. Um, though, as it says here, they're omnivorous. They do like meat. They can resort to fungi but uh, it's rumored they particularly enjoy eating drow. Let's hope there's not a drow in the party. But that being said, um, they also really like to collect and eat silver and electrum items. So once again, if any of these items are visible or obvious within the party's grasp, this could once again turn the whole thing. So, and this is once again just an example of what I'm talking about. Just with exploring the ecology of the creature, the ecology of the environment, we've managed to build from a cave mouth with some skeletons to a much more vibrant experience from the, the moss-encrusted, slightly silenced, rusty weapon-holding skeletons to the, the werebear who is tormented and, and exiled from his kingdom to save his love, back to the hook horror community in the backs of the caves, that's really just trying to protect their own and live their life as any creature would. This is no longer just a blind run through to kill a bunch of stuff and hopefully gain some treasure, but a living, vibrant community within the cave. And therein lies my whole point of, of tonight's example, which is bring your environment to life. Make your most important character count. Um, what color are the cave walls? What grows in the caves? What creatures are living there? What eats those creatures? What feeds those creatures? Are there any environmental concerns within the cave that could affect the life there? What's the history of the cave? What, why are these things here? Did they move here? Did they migrate here? Have they always been here? So on and so forth. I won't go on and on and on about various uh, examples of what I'm talking about. But I think you get the idea if you've followed me this far. The... Uh, the necessity of bringing your environment to life. There is no structure on any planet that I've explored or created that is not there without purpose, be it made by the hands, mandibles, claws, or whatever of the creatures that live there, or by the natural formation of the world that it takes place in. Everything has its place and purpose. And, and that is something to always keep in mind because I guarantee you at some point somebody's going to ask. Somebody's going to branch off on a tangent that's going to require you to know these things. So the more detail you have in advance, the smoother that storytelling session is going to go. Now, just as a, a, a disclaimer here, I, I am going to go out and say it's okay to pull shit out of your ass. It really is. It's perfectly all right to make things up on the fly. If you don't know, wing it. Um, if somebody calls you out on it, you've always got the deus ex machina, the, the god in the machine, 
of fantasy world magic equals I win. So if you can't explain it, there's always some catch-all reason that you can pull out to say why this works. You know, why are the skeletons animated? Why don't they just lie there? Magic. You know, it, it doesn't have to necessarily make scientific sense within the real world. It is a fantasy game. Please don't get those confused. We don't need a Maze and Monsters uh, situation starring Tom Hanks. But uh, beyond that, I think we kind of get the idea of what I'm talking about. Um, as far as the ecology of the dungeon. Now, everything we've explored thus far has been a natural occurring cave. So, you know, we've got cave crickets, we've got the, the cave fish, we've got the werebear, the skeletons, the hook horrors and their brood. We've got stalactite stalagmites, we've got lichens, we've got moss, we've got shriekers, we've got fungus. And these are all very common things. And like I said, I'm not going too crazy into detail because at the end of the day, it's your creation. And I don't want to direct you too much because honestly... And if anybody listening wants to, I'd love it if you could share your own creations with me. Not for any type of criticism, but because I really enjoy seeing what you've made. Um, one of the most fond things about being a gamer for me and a, and a game master and a, a creator is seeing where people go with these types of things. I think it's absolutely brilliant. Um, so, so briefly, without getting too crazy, um, I would like to maybe explore, in short, some of the, uh, I don't know, some of the possible, um, I'm going to change this up, sorry, my music getting kind of crazy there. Uh, by the way, I do have the Amazon widget, if you're watching, feel free to uh, pop it up and listen, I have some music playing in the background. Um, but I would like to explore some of the ecology of uh, man-made structures as well. Just a little. We won't harp too much on it. I don't want to uh, risk boring you if I can help it. Um, man-made structures are a little different from the naturally occurring. Right. So for instance, the cave we mentioned earlier can be easily formed, let's say, by tech tech tectonic shifting by mineral deposits, gas deposits, that, that type of thing. Naturally occurring phenomenon create uh, caves. Man-made structures serve a definitive purpose in almost all cases. Granted, it's nothing wrong with having a, a structure built for no purpose. It happens. But for the most part, especially in more of the, the fantasy uh, slash medieval settings, people didn't build without purpose because of the cost, the expense, the time, and the manpower that it took. So when you're creating a man-made edifice, a city or a town, for instance, it is not only important, but imperative to have purpose in mind. Now you're going to have a lot less of the naturally occurring ecology, but an ecology within a man-made structure or more importantly, a man-made settlement is equally as important. Where is the food coming from? How is it being produced? How is it being uh, modified and uh, made ready to be uh, stored and or eaten? What's the security? What's the law and order? What's the leadership? What's the crime? What's the uh, economy look like? What's the socio-political setting? And, and I know this seems like a lot of boring big words, but at the same time, it is all actually very important. Um, is there a homeless problem in your town? How are they eating? How are they surviving? How are they treated? What's the laws regarding them? Do they have any type of secret society or organization by which they're organized and lean on one another to survive? Are there multiple groups that are warring against one another? Um, are some more inclined to side with the city guard who may use them as eyes and ears on the streets? Or are they more like the street urchins of India and treated as subhuman? Um, this, once again, expands into the role-playing element of what we're talking about and allows you to build a vibrant 
organic story within your setting for your players to work in. It gives you more tools to manipulate that setting even. And in some cases, and a lot of DMs don't like to admit this, but in some cases you need to direct the flow of the story on a quiet level. You need to be able to direct your players into the narrative that you've created, if you can, um, so that your story doesn't go entirely to waste. Um, knowing your environment will actually, once again, allow for that. It will allow you the opportunity to manipulate the situation to direct your party where you need them to go. So knowing these details, once again, become an imperative. Um, you need to know the laws. You need to know the leadership. You need to know the sociopolitical economic structure of your town. What is the sewage system like? Do they have a underground waste disposal, water disposal system? Is the gray waste filtered through there as well? Um, have they moved on to a level of irrigation that includes aqueducts and, and similar technology? Um, are the farms outside the wall of the city? Does the city have a wall? Once again, these are the things that will allow you to craft a more vibrant living city. It will allow you to organize how things go within that city. It will open up side quests, role play opportunities, chances for your characters and your setting to grow and evolve into something that's much much more realistic, much more solidified in the minds of both you and your players as a active and living entity, so to speak, and make a more memorable and fun experience for you and the players once again as well. And one of my big things personally as a game master is fun first. Um, my players having a good time is my primary goal. It's why I game master at all, because I like to show a good time. I like to craft stories. And hopefully it's the reason why you're doing it too. If, if not, um, I would actually love to hear more about why you do it. If you have a different reason, um, please feel free to reach out and, and open that discussion with me anytime. I'm, I'm available in our homebrew RP discord. Uh, you, you can contact me through uh, here, Twitch. You can also contact me through YouTube or, or any of our other outlets. Um, homebrew RP. That's us. <laughs> but um, beyond that, uh, I did say we're going to try and start creating something. We've got, about 15 minutes left of my stream, although that's loose. If we go over, we go over. Not a big deal. Um, but I did say we were going to start doing something uh, within the realm of what we got going on here. We're going to start creating a little town uh, within the realm of Cairn together. And I know we, we probably don't have a lot of people watching at the moment, but as hopefully it grows... Uh, we can expand on this. And of course, even when I'm offline, it's something that I'm well open to discuss and, and plot and plan that we can pick up next week, next Tuesday, when, when I do this again. So uh, to start with, if anyone is watching, and I'll give you a minute to respond if anyone is, I like to start everything I do as far as creating t cities, towns, worlds, whatever, with a name. Um, there's great power in a name. Uh, as, as a lot of esoteric beliefs will tell you. So if anyone has any name ideas, uh, let's start there. I'll give you guys a minute to see if what you can come up with. Uh, if I don't hear anything in a minute or two, uh, just a minute, I'll, uh, I'll come up with one myself just to start. <coughs> but, uh, yeah. Um, please keep in mind... Once again, especially on a, a, a medieval fantasy setting, uh, names usually stem from somewhere. And it's one of the things we'll explore as we go. But uh, you don't want to just pick a name at random, so to speak. It, it works if you have to, but um, the, the town you live in, the name comes from something usually. A person, 
another place, uh, a culture, a religion, uh, even a uh, geological uh, situation or location will play into a part like uh, the dusty shore or, you know, uh, Harper's Ferry, you know, it, it, it all usually tends to play into it. So I'm not seeing anything yet. So I'm just going to go ahead and, and pick one out myself here. Um, let's see. Uh, let's just call this. We'll call this Silver Falls. Okay. So there's the name of our, our city, right? Silver Falls. So as I, as I just mentioned, let's discuss why we're going to call this Silver Falls. Okay. Uh, the easiest explanation is... That's, let's say there's a waterfall nearby, right? Waterfall nearby. The waterfall um, is made of white water, which for those of you who may be unfamiliar, white water is just fast moving, rushing water. Uh, it looks white because of the disruption through the water itself. So it's made of white water, lending to the name Right? So, right there, right off the bat, that gives us a nearby water supply. Now, it's very common for medieval style buildings uh, or settlements to almost always be built near a water supply. Um, it's not always easy to drop a well. Wells dry up. Um, it's not guaranteed that you could sink a well, just depending. So, we're going to say they did it for ease here. We have a, a water supply. Um, because of it and uh, it's a river that leads to a fall so there's a, a waterfall nearby so now we need to kind of determine what's the name of the river right um, once again as we're discussing this if anyone has any suggestions or ideas please throw them into chat and I'll be more than happy to start uh, implementing them and discussing them and using them but yeah so we have a river here um, why don't we name our river after our, our poor, dear, cursed werebearer? We'll call it the, uh, we'll call it the Kangas. That's a, that's a good river name. The Kangas River, which leads to the Silver Falls, on the banks of which is built Silver Falls itself, the village. All right, so we have the Silver Falls Village, right? So let's decide what we have here as far as our government, right? Um, what's our, our government, right? It's getting ahead of you there. What kind of government do we have? Um, if we're building this within my pre-existing uh, homebrew world, uh, most of where our adventures have taken place thus far are uh, within the human realms, uh, one of the bigger human realms known as the Bechtlerite Empire, which is the tattered remains of a once tremendously huge empire. So we'll say it's within the Bechtlerite Empire right now. The Bechtlerite Empire is ruled by a sovereign leader and a uh, kind of a, a, a republic as well. So we're going to say it's a a uh, let's see. It's uh, I got to remember the name of it. I'm having a moment. <laughs> it's a monarchy with a senate constitutional monarchy perfect so the Bechtlerite Empire is actually a constitutional monarchy we'll write that down 
So it is a constitutional monarchy. So most likely we're going to have some type of appointed leader here, um, a, a voted in leader. That could be a mayor, it could be a burgomeister. Um, really, uh, titles are irrelevant. You can make up your own title if you want for these type of thing. You could be the grand poobah. What matters more is that the structure of the government within uh, your world fits into the narrative of, of as far as, as how he functions or she functions within that elected uh, situation. So we have a constitutional monarchy. We have an appointed, I like Burgermeister. Let's use that. All right, so we have an appointed Burgermeister. We'll name him, um, oh, let's, let's do her. We'll name her Lillian Tovor. Oh, that's a nice name, right? Lillian Tovar, Burgermeister of Silver Falls. So we have an elected official. Um, she also, let's say, answers to a council that we'll call, wow, spelling too enough. Yeah, so she answers to the Council of... Now, keep in mind, the Bechtelite Empire is a very uh, heady society. They're very big on intelligence, and, and they have uh, kind of a department uh, for everything. So, uh, so we'll just say, we'll keep it simple. She answers the Council of Representatives. My spelling's not going to embarrass me. So she answers the Council of Representatives. We'll say this council is six elected uh, common folk representing um, representing the, the infrastructure of the town. So within that infrastructure, we have food, waste disposal, uh, import exports, security, um, common goods, you know, taking care of the, 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 the people's needs themselves. And um, let's see, uh, we'll say an ambassador, an ambassador from the main core of the city itself. So based on what we've got here, and I know this is a little dry and I apologize, but based on what we've got here, we've actually created a, a whole um, pecking order. So we have all of our infrastructure represented. So based upon whatever the party's needs or questions are, they have an individual they can go to to ask. We have a hierarchy within we have a leader that is elected that answers to a group of representatives of the local community. Um, once again, there's all kinds of, of intrigue and plots that, that can spawn out of that, um, as well as, as drama and intrigue that could be pulled. And, and what we're building right now isn't a huge town. This is a small town. So you can imagine how much on a grand scale in a bigger city, you could really go with this, how much more insane it could get. But within the very beginnings of Silver Falls that we have here, we, we have an infrastructure starting to form already. Um, and this is without even getting into the fun guts of the situation. So I think this is a this is actually a pretty good start. And we'll, we'll even put our little hook horror cave on the outskirts of town because I have a feeling that may come into play later. Um, and I think it's, it's a good, once again, opportunity, a role play opportunity. Um, so I think we'll revisit it. But anyway, I think, I think we're going to, we're going to stop our creation here. And uh, once again, if you're watching uh, now, or even if you're picking this up later on, on Twitch or on YouTube, 
I do hope that you'll consider what we've spoken about tonight. And uh, I hope you'll be willing to contribute and ask questions um, and add to what we're creating here. I, I, once again, I would love to hear your ideas, your thoughts, criticisms, concerns. Uh, I'm not a terribly ego-driven person. So if you have any criticisms even, please let me know. I'm all very open to try and grow myself as what we're doing here at Homeboro RP as well. Um, so that said, I would like to thank all of you for joining us. I do hope you'll tune in. Uh, as I said, three Saturdays a week, we do our homebrew world of Cairn, uh, play testing with a very solid group of, uh, adventurers that I'm very proud to call friends and gaming companions. Um, uh, the fourth Saturday we do Sigil Confidential which is a Noir adventure in Sigil in the Planescape setting, the City of Doors, uh, which is actually a carryover from a previous session. We did the Stapleton Investigations, if, which are available on our YouTube as well. Um, Fridays, we do every other week uh, Dresden in the Big Easy, which is hosted by Lord of Chance, our resident game master for that session. Uh, it's actually turning out to be very interesting. Um, and is growing as a, and expanding exponentially as we go. Please uh, feel free to tune into any of those. We're going to be expanding, and feel free to join us on Discord. Um, we're looking to expand and do more games during the week. If you're interested, let us know. If you have any ideas, let us know. Uh, if you even want to run a game, let us know uh, during the week, and we'll meet up and do a little interview and see what you got and maybe look at putting you on the air. Um, that said, thank you very much for joining me. Uh, I've really actually enjoyed doing this. I hope you didn't get too bored listening to me ramble on. Um, once again, I am the Church Warden, a.k.a. The Wonka, coming to you live from the Lee Pad here at the epicenter of the multiverse on twitch.tv forward slash homebrewrp, putting my face in your interwebs. Thank you, and good night.